Hello, everyone, and welcome to the session of the London Global Cancer Week, organized by the Children's Cancer Center of Lebanon, or CCCL. Our two-hour session is very rich and diverse today, where we have six leading speakers tackling cancer control in the MENA region and how cultivating cross-regional relationships can enhance it. At the end of the session, you'll be able to get an overview of cancer control, control initiatives, best practices for cross-regional collaborations and partnerships, and their importance in crisis settings, as well as the importance of advocacy in cancer control. And finally, a beautiful and inspiring talk from childhood cancer survivor. I want to thank you all for joining us. Just a few housekeeping notes before we start. Please keep your microphones on mute while the speakers are presenting. Please use the chat option on, on Zoom to add your comments or questions during the session. We will have time at the end of the session for questions and answers to the speakers. So please, you can then also use the raise hand if you prefer to speak on the microphone and on the camera. Our session is recorded as you can see, and thank you for consenting to that. My name is Karen Khoury and I am the Public Relations and External Affairs Manager at the CCCL. The Children's Cancer Center of Lebanon, or CCCL, is a leading national organization dedicated to the treatment and support of kids and adolescents with cancer. In addition to being a national advocate of childhood cancer control and a leading NGO in Lebanon and the region. Inaugurated in 2002, the CCCL supports almost 50% of children with cancer in Lebanon, including non-Lebanese coming from the Arab region and refugees, and with ages ranging between few months old up to 18 years. The CCCL covers all treatment costs of patients without any discrimination, even costs beyond those covered by third-party payers. And we ensure quality service to patients in accordance with global standards, leading to an amazing 80% average cure rate, similar to that in developed countries. Champions from the CCCL who organized our session today are Imad Al Haji and Aya Sophia Khairallah. And I want to thank them very much for putting this beautiful session together. And a warm thanks to our distinguished speakers. Without further delay, allow me to present our first speaker for today. Dr. André Elbaoui, who is the technical officer for, the, for cancer control at the World Health Organization. Dr. Elbaoui is a medical doctor, specialized and double board certified in surgical oncology. He joined the World Health Organization in 2015 and now serves as the focal point for cancer program at the WHO headquarters in Geneva. In his current position, Dr. Ibari is responsible for the implementation uh, of the 2017 World Health Assembly Resolution on Cancer Prevention and Control. He is also the executive editor of the 2020 WHO report on cancer and has supported additional WHO publications on broad topics ranging from guidance on cancer prevention to access to cancer health products. He also led the development of the WHO IR priority setting tool for cancer control, workforce optimization strategies, and other tools to support capacity building. He also led the launch of the WHO Global Initiative on Childhood Cancer in 2018, which is now being implemented in more than 30 countries. And he supported the launch of the WHO Global Breast Cancer Initiative in 2021, and the implementation of the WHO Cervical Cancer Initiative based on the World Health Assembly Resolution on the Global Strategy to Accelerate the Elimination of Cervical Cancer. Dr. Elbawi, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, really, Karen. And it's so wonderful to see so many dear colleagues and friends come together on this important occasion. As we get started, and as alluded to in the chat, uh, our warmest uh, appreciation and greeting to you at the Children's Cancer Center of Lebanon, to many of you who are dear colleagues and friends, leaders in the region and beyond. This is a very important occasion. London Global Cancer Week is a moment to come together as a community, but also to spend time and reflect on what has happened in the Middle East. Uh, for the next about 12 minutes, I'll focus on the broader global and regional context and close perhaps with some thoughts on next steps. 
The uh, talk is organized in these three areas. First, to understand what is the global cancer burden, what are variations between Europe and the Middle East, and what is the relevance in cancer control planning. Second, what are some of the priority interventions for us to consider as we look to address the cancer burden for children and for adults? And finally, how can we come together as a community to drive progress? To begin, these are figures that we all know well. The map itself that shows that in Europe and in the Americas, there is a very high cancer burden that if a person of a specific age range has a significantly higher risk of developing cancer in their lifetime than what we see in Africa or certain parts of Asia. But the numbers perhaps don't tell the full story. The best way to understand it is in this regard, perhaps. If you live in Europe, about one in two or one in three will develop cancer in their lifetime. That is a tremendous and startling statistic. It does influence or impact every country, every person, and every community throughout their life course. In the Middle East, it's not that different. In fact, for many countries, it's as common as one in four or one in six. So again, cancer really is a disease burden that all of us will be touched by directly during our lifetime. One always wonders why. Why is cancer so common? Why is it increasingly common in many countries? Well, there would be three possible explanations. First, simply that people are living longer. The longer people live, the more likely they are to develop cancer. Second, well, in fact, that populations continue to grow. If, if we have more children, it increases the total population and by extension, increases the total number of people at risk of cancer. Or third, we're adopting new and more dangerous lifestyles with greater exposure to risk factors. When we look at what of these three factors is driving the global cancer burden, it in fact is in part a success story. It is because people are living longer. That is the most common reason we see a total increase in cancer cases. But in certain regions, like in the Middle East, there is a significant increase in trends at the risk factor level, increased uptake of tobacco, increased physical inactivity and obesity. These persistent and increasing risk factors in the region will drive the cancer burden for the decades ahead. So what are the primary risk factors for us to focus on? If we ask this at the global level and put it into four categories, the most common and the most important risk factor considered in all regions is tobacco. Tobacco single-handedly is responsible for about 25% of deaths from cancer, 25%. So tobacco does remain a primary focus in the prevention of cancer. The second group, infectious causes, are very relevant, 13% globally. Environmental risk factors are increasingly placing a burden in cancer. You can see those include air pollution, also very relevant in the Middle East and the region beyond. And of course, genetics plays an important factor as well. Each of them must have a unique strategy. But as the talk is intended to reflect, there are significant differences between regions. If we look at those differences, in Europe, for example, in Europe, the primary driver remains tobacco. In the Middle East, tobacco is increasing, but still doesn't have the proportional burden that we see in the European region. In fact, in the Middle East, it's still struggling with some of the historic infectious causes of cancer, whether they be helicobacter pylori, and this comes from water sanitation, or from hepatitis or human papilloma virus. Alcohol, of course, more common in Europe. Obesity, significantly increasing in the Middle East. So these are the ways that we start to break down what are the priorities now and what must we consider as we look at trends in the decades ahead. Are we making progress? As we know, all governments have committed to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. In the non-communicable disease arena, specifically in cancer, there are two targets that are most relevant. First, to reduce premature mortality, and second, to achieve universal health coverage. So how do we reduce premature mortality towards that one-third target? And is there a difference again between Europe and the Emerald region? I'm sorry for the typo, but you can see on the top in this yellow box here that the Middle East in fact has been stagnant. There has been minimal to no progress and most countries in the Middle East will not achieve the SDG target. Comparatively, in the European region, we can see that many countries are in fact on track and some in fact will achieve it. Well, how about universal health coverage and why does it matter? Here we can see again, when we look at how our country's performing on the universal health coverage service index score, 
most of the European countries are meeting a threshold of quality universal health coverage, 70, 80% of what the target score is. Comparatively, again, in the Middle East, many countries are failing to achieve this. Why is universal health coverage important? Well, in fact, we just released a paper in which when we look at what is the strongest predictor of improvements in cancer mortality, looking at breast cancer as a reference, the most important predictor is how is the country offering its universal health coverage services? So this is a part of the discussion to remember as we go through the next points. Universal health coverage is a key priority on the political front, on the advocacy front for us to achieve the SDGs, to save lives and to reduce mortality from cancer. Just to share parenthetically, the only other factor that really informed the reduction in, in uh, cancer mortality is the number of public centers that offer cancer services, public cancer centers that is. So when we think about what do we need to do to build capacity, what are our ultimate targets? Focusing on universal coverage, focusing on building capacity are those guiding principles. So how are we doing it in a more practical way? Well, the way to organize is to think of it in three stages. First, to set priorities. Second, to invest wisely. And third, to offer cancer care for all. These were the pillars of that WHO report that Karen so kindly referenced. As a reference and as a starting point, let's start with setting priorities. How are governments doing in setting priorities? Here, as an example, we've looked at how many countries are offering breast cancer screening services, but do not offer treatments. You can see low-income countries, lower middle-income countries, a significant percentage of them are offering screening, but not offering treatment. When we look into that a bit further, are they in fact even screening for the right target population? Are they impacting population outcomes in a meaningful way? And unfortunately, we see in most low-income countries, the answer is no. Now, why is this relevant? It is in part because inefficiency and expenditure in cancer ultimately disrupts the overall architecture of a cancer program. If a country, as an example, is paying for a breast cancer screening program at scale, that is about 30 times the cost of the childhood cancer program. And if they're screening and not treating, or if they're screening and doing so for the wrong population, they won't be saving lives. When, if even again, one out of 30 would be used to allocate to childhood cancer, we know that lives could be saved. So fundamentally, as a starting point, going to governments and always asking, we need more money for health, is an important narrative. As we know, in the current COVID pandemic, many governments are seeing budget uh, shortages, insufficient funds for health, and current economic downturns that will threaten their health budgets for the years ahead. So an important parameter to ask is, well, are we setting the right priorities? Childhood cancer, as we all know, is one of those best buys. When comparatively, breast cancer screening, while important in some settings, may not be the most efficient use of resources in other low and middle income countries. How about investing wisely? And here's again where we see the important imperative for us in civil society and in the public health community. If we start with the question of, well, how much are governments spending on cancer? If we ask this in Europe, per capita, meaning per citizen in a country, not per patient, but per citizen, a country in the European region or North America spends about $100 to $400 per year for all cancer services. Comparatively, a country like Lebanon is closer to about 10, maybe less. So it starts with a fundamental challenge. Obviously, the health budget for cancer in a country in the Middle East is going to be less. And that reference point makes it difficult. Because when money doesn't come from the government, it must come from somewhere else. And where is it coming from? Most commonly from people's pockets. Assets being sold, homes being sold, livelihoods being lost because people are having to pay out of pocket for cancer. Greater than 60% in many low and middle income countries. But does cancer have to be expensive? In fact, it doesn't. It starts with the question of where are we putting our money and what is the ultimate value? When we did this analysis as part of a global investment case, what we showed here is while we all wanna talk about the importance of medicines as the primary driver of cost, in fact, that's only about 22% of the cost that's needed. In fact, the greatest investments that we have to make is in each other. Health workforce for cancer, investing in civil societies, supporting the overall architecture of human resources is really the driver of improving health outcomes for cancer, 57% of the overall cost. And this doesn't have to be expensive. If we look at that basic package and start as a reference, that basic package could be as little as $3.95, but it requires that we invest wisely. What are some of the challenges that we see? Well, if you start to include some of those more expensive therapies, 
that $4 budget can quickly become higher and higher and higher. And quickly, you will see that double or triple the expected investments that are required for cancer become insurmountable for governments to make. $7.60. We doubled it just by focusing on the wrong medicines and the wrong technologies. And this shifts investments away from people and towards medicines and technologies. So how do we make the right investments is one of the key pillars for us to succeed. And then finally, what is the importance of universal health coverage? Again, to reiterate, if we take a country like Uganda, compare it with South Korea, we could put any Middle Eastern country here as a starting point and ask, what is the difference in outcomes using breast cancer as a benchmark? If we start 20%, 25% breast cancer survival in a country like Uganda, 80% in Korea, what is the biggest difference? Is it because they don't have trastuzumab in Uganda? In fact, that's not. One of the most effective interventions is Down same disease. Make cancer care available, detect it earlier. The second is to improve treatment complexity, yes. So we can increase the level of complexity, offer new targeted therapies, but you can see the value. It's not gonna bridge that 20, 80% very quickly. Treatment quality, also an important parameter. It will also increase about 10%. But the bulk is simply by offering more care to more people. Offering more care to more people will save the most lives. And that doesn't mean offering more complex care, offering the care that works, the cost-effective care that can save lives to more people as they've done in the Children's Cancer Center of Lebanon. Offer it to the people who come, you will save lives. And if we build cancer infrastructure, people will come. So this is where we should focus our investments. How do we build the capacity so that people are not wondering, can I make it to the hospital? Is the care going to be available? What are we doing here at WHO? And it's so wonderful to have this panel discussion with Kathy Kutcher Jones from SIOP. Many of you know SIOP is one of our key partners for the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer. Also, of course, the Children's Cancer Center of Lebanon. It's also wonderful to have Tim Eden on the call. Tim, thank you for all that you've done for the childhood cancer community. This is one of the three childhood cancer initiatives that we've really focused our work on. What are we doing? Well, again, since we're in a small group, we won't go into too many details with the slide. You know what we're doing and why we're doing it. Just to add, the number of countries that are taking on the initiative have been quite remarkable. We were worried what the pandemic would bring. And in, to be frank, it has slowed down the country movement in childhood cancer, but it has not slowed countries from making a commitment to do something for childhood cancer now and in the future. We are in dialogue with now almost 56 countries actively working in about 40 countries. We have regional networks in four regions. Iptahal is on the call. She was one who really helped drive forward the work in the Eastern Mediterranean regions. These regional networks are very, very important. We have partners. We're very grateful for those partners. It does take a community. Many of you know the important contribution that St. Jude has made to help jumpstart this work. And now is not a global good, a community effort that reflects the contributions of each of you. We have a cure-all approach, an investment case, I'm sorry we weren't able to bring onto the call Dr. Roberta Ortiz, who's now leading this initiative and doing so well in it. This approach is moving forward. Let's focus a bit on what we've been able to achieve. Again, the most important part of a discussion like this today is to hear each other's voice. So I won't spend too much time sharing with you some of the impact that we've had in the initiative. One thing to share again is what has civil society been able to do to drive towards these Civil society is responsible for the legislation and universal health coverage in two countries. Civil society is responsible for driving and training the workforce in certain areas. Civil society has been able to advocate for access to medicines, including in countries like Lebanon. These are the foundations for us to be able to move forward, to drive progress, and to impact lives. This multi-sectoral response. So two last slides to close. Maud, a dear friend, asked, look, please just be very concrete. What are some of the actions that we can do as a community? So if okay, I'm gonna propose three. Ask and then act. For universal health coverage, of course, it's an important principle. What does that mean for the average civil society organization? Well, first to ask this, is cancer included in the public financing system? This is something that every government would know, but many of us in the cancer community are unable to answer. At WHO, we now have gathered data from over hundred countries to be able to identify, is it in the benefit package? But this is something that all of us should be able to answer. What services, what medicines, and why? Because we know that this is an important driver of outcomes. And as a second dimension, we also know that it impacts financial hardship. But not to stop there, as we heard so wisely from Karen at the beginning, it's important also to ask what else is driving costs? 
there are indirect costs that are driving people away from care or away from completing therapy. Is it the hospital costs? Is it the hotel costs? Is it the loss of employment? What are the indirect costs that are causing children or adults to abandon or to interrupt their therapy? And then what can we do? Well, as a, as a community, it is important to develop consensus on the priorities. We can't go to government and say, please pay for everything because everything in cancer must be paid for, it must be free. We do have to set priorities in our own community. And by doing so, we can help drive the agenda forward by showing we have that consensus and by also acknowledging that we can contribute to those indirect costs. Number two, invest in people. So what are some of the things that we need to ask? Do we have a sufficient workforce? We also know that the pandemic has threatened people, the health workforce directly. The health workforce has been harmed because of burnout, absenteeism, and the emerging burden that will come from interrupted or delays in therapy because people haven't been able to get to hospitals. Do we have the right workforce? Is there support for psychosocial care needs? And if not, what do we need to do to generate them? Here again is an important interface for civil society, for hospitals, for professional societies to act. How can we influence national policies? How can we develop relevant training programs? And finally, what can we do as a community? Because for us to succeed, we must align ourselves. So we start with this question of what types of programs beyond cancer can accelerate our progress? Working within child health or NCDs or vaccines or climate change. Cancer affects all and cancer is affected by all. It is a bilateral relationship. So how can we use different entry points and build richer networks within our advocacy communities? That is an important consideration if we are going to succeed. One last Commandant Act. So this is a tricky one. We both have to be patient and not patient. Universal health coverage takes time. Most European countries, it took 50 years for any semblance of universal health coverage to be achieved. We're asking governments to achieve it within the SDGs in a 10 or 15 year time period. That is incredibly difficult. But at the same point, we know that crises offer us a new opportunity. In fact, if you look at the European region, one of the most transformational moments, and very unfortunate at that, but one of those moments that really framed health as a priority was World War II. And we're all wondering what's gonna happen as we emerge from COVID. Is this the right time to shift the political dialogue back to health fully? So this is again, where civil society can take a lead and leverage the opportunities. And then finally, let's continue to build this social movement. This is a photo of someone I met at a cancer conference as he was sitting outside a homeless person. You can see cancer is a very personal disease. We know this, but we also get caught, and this is not for this group, within the broader community. We often focus on those big ticket items, those emerging cures, without stopping to ask, are we meeting the needs of people with cancer? Are we meeting the needs of those affected by the disease? All of you are doing that. But when we go to larger meetings, let us challenge each other and say, please let us make sure that people affected by cancer remain at the center of our work. This is exactly what Karen so nicely started. And in fact, we're very excited to also hear from the cancer, uh, the person affected by cancer later today. So thank you again for the opportunity. Really, as all of us know, what Lebanon has been through has just been so difficult to see from the outside. And we at WHO remain very engaged to see how we can support the needs for the cancer community in the country. Thank you for coming together for cancer, for the region, and for our dear colleagues at the Childhood at the Children's Cancer Center of Lebanon. Thank you, Karen, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Andre. This was uh, really beautiful, uh, beautifully structured. And I am sure I already noted some questions and I'm sure a lot of our uh, attendees also enjoyed it. Moving on to our second talk today, uh, I'd like to present to you Mrs. Hena Shahar Shaib, who is the General Manager of the Children's Cancer Center of Lebanon and the Board Member of the Union for International Cancer Control. Mrs. Hena is an exceptional leader and advocate of childhood cancer. She has led the CCCL for almost 20 years into becoming one of the region's leading reference centers for the treatment and support of kids with cancer without any cost on their parents or any discrimination and only dependent on donations. Year after year, Ms. Hanna was able to ensure a growing number of patients supported, increased fundraising and motivated the team and enhanced quality management system to cope with the various challenges. Even with the many crises in the region, she was able to mitigate risks and ensure childhood cancer patients have adequate access to care and treatment through partnerships and high impact agreements with stakeholders in Lebanon and the region to develop the status of cancer control. 
She led setting up the CCCL UK Limited in 2014, a UK-based charity, where she also sits on its board of directors and emphasizes her commitment and agility in resource mobilization and global reach. In, 2000 and, uh, in October 2020, Ms. Hanna was elected as a member of the UICC Board of Directors. Ms. Hanna, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, I'm going to hand the floor, it's yours. Thank you, Karen, and thank, thank you so much, Dr. Elbawi and all the speakers for, uh, for participating with us today. It's really uh, a pleasure. I seize this opportunity to thank uh, Karen, Ahmad, and Aya for organizing this session. And yes, true, despite all the challenges that uh, Lebanon is passing through, we are still being able to organize such sessions and to stay committed to our mission and raising awareness so that we ensure that our mission continues in saving the lives of children diagnosed with cancer. Uh, throughout uh, the recent years, the Eastern Mediterranean region witnessed act active and impactful collaborations that brought forth a variety of initiatives and innovations for cancer control. But all through the whole continent, from prevention and early detection programs, to access to quality treatment and support, to palliative care and cancer survivor programs, the region is still leveraging multifactorial partnership, even across countries. Today, I would like to highlight the most important factors for NGOs that contribute to successful collaborations and partnership for cancer control. Dr. Elbawi mentioned how important it is for the civil society to remain active, and this is what I also want to concentrate on. Another aspect that I need to highlight is the importance of NGOs acting fast, efficient, and effectively to create impact, because as we all know, cancer doesn't wait. Through my role as the general manager of the Children's Cancer Center of Lebanon for almost 20 years and being actively involved in the Union of International Cancer Control since 2018, more so as a board member for the last year, I have witnessed firsthand how impactful global multi-stakeholder conversations, initiatives and partnerships can be. And more importantly, how much a, of a crucial role all NGOs have to play in creating this impact. A first example of that is the Children's Cancer Center of Lebanon, CCCL itself which was founded by a visionary group of philanthropists who wants to save the, ch the children's lives and based the foundation on a partnership with a national and regional medical center, that is the American University of Beirut Medical Center, for service delivery and the global research pioneer, that is St. Jude Children Research Hospital. The CCL efforts throughout the years influenced the status of childhood cancer control in Lebanon, as it offered full-fledged solutions treating and caring for kids with cancer and their families, in addition to promoting awareness about the disease and empowering healthcare workers and childhood cancer advocates through capacity building. Focused on our mission, the Children's Cancer Center of Lebanon also was able to identify the gaps for, ch for childhood cancer control in the country and reacted uh, and reached out to uh, partners with, stake with all the stakeholders to fill these gaps. First, we reached to the government through the Ministry, Ministry of Public Health, an ongoing and evolving partnership which had yielded impact in childhood cancer control strategies, increased access to treatment and care, and brought forth joint projects for continuously driving the strategy towards an impactful direction. We have around 450 new childhood cancer diagnoses uh, the diagnoses are made every year in Lebanon and all of them have access to treatment. Health second was the healthcare work, uh, workers and hospitals to continue empowering them, ensuring adequate and quality service to patients because with a cure rate of for childhood cancer that reaches 80%, this is thanks to all their efforts in doing so. Other NGOs to grow the cause and increase needed support and contributions through developing projects for growth and greater patient benefits and satisfaction. Even with the Syrian crisis that, was, that happened in, the 20, in 2011, the influx of refugees to Lebanon 
all the refugee children diagnosed with cancer and who have no health coverage at all were treated at, uh, and cared for at the CCCL in Lebanon totally for free. Also, we concentrate on individuals and corporates because to promote awareness and create opportunities for giving and supporting kids with cancer and prom promoting philanthropy, cancer patients cannot, fi cannot fight the disease alone. We need each other and we need to be together and united for cancer patients. The CCCL, as mentioned by Karen, is solely dependent on donation to fulfill its life-saving mission. And the commitment and the generosity of donors have, has been a driving force to advance childhood cancer in Lebanon. So how, we did, how did we do all of that? Very important factors for NGOs to contribute to successful collaboration for cancer control are a few factors. One, that is to identify the gaps and needs within a country. Two, cont contextualizing and quantifying it through an evidence-based approach. Three, focusing on positively driving impact through stakeholder networking and prioritization and all the while aiming to reduce inefficiencies and remain impact driven. And finally, to remain sustainable through proper governance and management. And this is very crucial. This has been the CL experience and learning through its 20 years in Lebanon, which is, developing, which is a developing country with very, very limited resources, but very active NGO sector. Adding to that, what NGOs need to continue prioritize, prior, prioritizing for successful collaboration and partnership is the constructive exchange of experiences. And this is what we need to highlight on across countries and the regions, what works and what doesn't work between various programs, even in different continental setups and regardless of cultural differences. And this is when global member organizations like UICC, SIO, CCI, and others have a huge role to play in convening the cancer ca control community and providing opportunities for collaborations. Through my involvement with the UICC, I witnessed firsthand how beneficial and essential global convening events can be in cultivating relationships among the cancer control community, aligning objectives and creating more impact across the world, providing great opportunities for partnerships and empowering the cancer, con cancer control community with capacity building. And to this, we have many examples. In our global, uh, global world today, NGOs cannot survive and thrive without outreach and exchange of data and experiences. Just two days ago marked the first anniversary of the launch of the WHO Global Strategy for the Elimination of Cervical Cancer, a strategy that identifies clear global targets by 2030 for a breakthrough in global cancer control, that is 90, 70, 90 targets of this strategy. We need to reach some, we need to reach a percentage where 90% of girls fully vaccinated with HPV vaccine by age of 15 years, where 70% of women are screened with a high performance test by 35 years of age and again 25 years of age, where 90% of women identified with cervical disease receive treatment. Just we want to imagine how many lives we can start saving if we start action today and now. The UICC had been a major driving force in increasing conversation and action for the elimination of cervical cancer. Thanks to their World Cancer Day, the 21 Days Challenge revolving around cervical cancer awareness, the CL team was inspired to develop a program for children in Lebanon to receive the HPV vaccine. Through an empowering governance, close connections with specialized healthcare professionals and pharma, proactively and efficiency, proactivity and efficiency, the CCL was able to launch its HPV vaccine program on World Health Day, April 7, 2021. The program promotes awareness about the HPV 
about cervical cancer in general and the importance of the HPV vaccine and ensures access and coverage of the vaccine to children in Lebanon. We started providing the vaccine to childhood cancer survivors, the survivors who are at the, uh, at the Children Cancer Center of Lebanon since April, and planning to take the program nationally with partner support next year. This example actually brings me to my second point today, which is the importance of NGOs to act fast, efficient, and effectively to create positive Im impact. Despite the challenges that we face every day in Lebanon and in the region, we are at the CCL discovering adapting, and while we were at the CCL discovering and adapting, to the COVID and the new normal that had been created, we were proactivity and efficiency where our contingency assessment and planning, they all were the key in order for us to act quickly. To be able to successfully de develop such plans and being efficient and have efficient reactions, it's important for every NGO to always have the following, to set the priorities also as, as mentioned by Dr. Elbawi, to empower the teams and to have an operation that is up to date. And this is a process and a journey which NGOs need to take. It will require a lot of effort. However, the outcome will be very promising, especially in cancer control, where so many factors are constantly changing. So NGOs have this very important role in driving conversations, collaborations, and partnerships in order to, to have an impactful outcome. An example I can share uh, about agile and effective crisis management was our relief, the CCCL relief response to, uh, to, the, to the blast that happened in August 2020. Only five days after this blast, which destroyed several hospitals in Lebanon, and where we had set a streamlined patient referral process to ensure all childhood cancer patients in Lebanon had access to treatment, medication, and care, and were all covered by the CCCL and a close coordination with all pediatric oncologists and hospitals in the country, as well as international suppliers and supporters. To conclude, cultivating cross-regional relationships for cancer control also needs alignment, alignment on common objectives, on common targets between stakeholders, where complementing each other, and add, this will add to the sustainability and efficiency of these partnerships. I would like to, see, to seize this opportunity to thank the London Global Cancer Week for bringing us together from across the globe and empowering members for collaborations and knowledge sharing to advance cancer control. I also want to salute high childhood cancer survivors I know who are among us today and all the cancer survivors who remain our inspiration. We have to keep our voices high and together we can have healthier and safer communities. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Beautiful, beautiful talk. Thank you so much. NGOs are indeed playing a huge role in cancer control.